Let's go back in time a bit and talk about how the tones evolved along with how the basic operation evolved. Because back at that time, I did have a sound in my mind, and partly it came from being a sax player. And partly it came from just hearing about the complaints that uh, my musician friends and customers all had. Now, the stuff they were using in those days might be regarded as top vintage prizes these days, but back when they were just the current gear, they just were the current gear. There was nothing special about them. Int intrinsically good stuff, mind you. Uh, good old blackface fenders um, will always be great amplifiers. But still the complaint that everybody had was that you couldn't separate playing loudness from the drive characteristics. Now that's real important because in rock and roll and blues, of course, you guys all know, but people that aren't players don't really know, that to get the whole expressive dimension of, of an amplifier cranked up, you have to crank up an amplifier. At least you did in those days. And then you were stuck in the, uh, in the loudness uh, quarry, whereas certain amp was too loud for a room, another amp wasn't loud enough for another room, and so on and so forth. But that was a serious problem in those days. Everybody, particularly Carlos Santana, we used to complain, even with his jacked up Princeton's, uh, that some notes would hang some nights and other, other notes wouldn't, and it was unpredictable. And he really, couldn't, he really couldn't hang with that because it was a kind of a confidence loser if he would step out and go to hit a big climactic note and it would just plink and die out. So luckily, um, I ended up stumbling onto something that became kind of the holy grail of, of tone and how to solve this problem. I knew a guy named Lee Michaels pretty well. He was another one of the great prune customers. And uh, even though he was really well known as a keyboard player, singer, songwriter, had a number of hits, he was interested in playing guitar. I remember him saying, well, you know, keyboards, even the Hammond, man, you're just pushing buttons and the sound is coming from somewhere else. Guitar, your fingers, it's your flesh is actually there, you know, picking the note and fretting the note and so forth. So you got to be a pretty good guitar player. Played with a lot of rock fire and a lot of passion, and he was a gear junkie. This is about the time that Monster Power Amps were just becoming, well, just actually being created and invented. The first one was the DC 300 by Crown. And I remember Lee telling me about it, and it was like, wow, that's unbelievable. At any rate, so Lee got a fleet of these, and he was trying to figure out how to, how to, how to work them into a guitar rig. And he had hired several different companies one after the other to try to build him some sort of a guitarish preamp. Nobody had been able to do it. And finally, he just asked me because, you know, we'd hang around a lot. And so, um, sure, I said, yeah, why not? I'll give it a try. I didn't really have a lot of hope for it. Didn't even know what kind of signal it took to drive the crowns. But I was always a fan of Fender stuff. And so I took basically a, a Fender-ish preamp circuit. And... I added another tube, another entire stage of tube amplification into the basic circuitry. And in order to make it controllable, I put a whole series of gain controls, you know, potentiometers, volume controls, at several points on the circuit. Not only to control it, but also to figure out how to dial it in, thinking that I would come back later and put fixed resistors in place of some of them. Well, I finally got this thing all put together and took it over to Lee's house to, to demo it. He had a great big, beautiful brown shingle house up in the hills of Mill Valley behind our store. And it didn't work. And we kept turning up the preamp and turning up the preamp because we'd hear this little fizzly sound coming out of this giant 412 cab that he had. And uh, I was just humiliated and depressed and started to unplug it all and pack up and go home when I realized the speakers were plugged directly into the preamp, not into the power amp. So I replugged it, and uh, of course by then we had every knob turned up about as far as they would go. I told Lee to go ahead and hit a chord. Man, he hit a giant power chord and just about blew our bodies through the back wall of that studio. But man, we were grinning because it had tone right out the gate. It sounded like the biggest, hugest fender on steroids that you ever heard coming through this giant 412 cab with this mega wattage behind it. But it really had all the fender characteristics that were desirable. 
Then we got to adjusting those three volume controls, and not only were we able to get the loudest, cleanest, best sounding Fender uh, clean sound you ever heard, but we were able to go into this other realm of gain that nobody had heard before. And we achieved that, of course, by turning up all of the controls near the front end, and then we were able to control the loudness separately by turning down what, what really was the master. Now, here's the deal. Some guys had offered a mod around those days of putting a master on a Fender amp. That was one mod I never did. And the reason I didn't do it was because it wasn't really successful at achieving the goal. And the reason that was, was because there's not enough gain in a Fender preamplifier to allow it to sufficiently overdrive the preamp no matter what you do. In fact, that was Fender's whole goal, was lack of distortion. Go back and look at the great uh, the literature for the great 410 tweed basement circuit. First of all, it's a bass amp. At least that's what they thought it was going to be. Second, they talk about how hi-fi it is with this robust 60 watts and how clean and clear it is, which of course is what you want for, uh, for a bass amplifier. But the fact is, its overdrive characteristics were what made it such a great guitar amplifier, its ability to distort. Well, Fender still didn't quite understand that because when they introduced the Blackface series, what they touted those was they had even increased headroom, which meant they were even more difficult to distort because they thought that lack of distortion was the goal, just like with hi-fis, and, and truly it was, except that, of course, Chuck Berry had come along in the meantime and turned that tweed basement to 12. Not 10, not 11, they went to 12, baby. And, um, you know, that tone had this whole element of express, uh, expression and, and uh, ex juju and juice that, uh, you know, everybody was after. And, you know, you can see the rock sounds of guitar being born right here. Okay, so you could increase the gain on a Fender preamp incrementally. Unfortunately, every increment of gain you increased caused a, an incremental decrease in the, uh, in the tone structure that you had already. Because when you were getting the gain, you were mostly pumping more and more mid-range to it, and you're leaving out the scoop and, and just what makes it shimmering and fat in the first place. So I didn't want to go down that road and so I kept the, the tonal part of the Fender stuff pretty dead on accurate because tones are golden. And then just added the gain via this additional tube. 